Good morning. Thank you all for being here this morning. That was a great start on the Memorial Day celebration today. Thank you, Spring Valley Academy. I'd like, to, if I could, to mention a few people who honored guests here this morning. We have the Centerville VFW Post 9550 Color Guard. They're up on the hill, and it's Commander Richard Lauterbauer, Gene Gregory, Paul Johnson, and Fred Rojas. We thank them for being here today as the Color Guard for the VFW. We also are honored today to have the Centerville Police Honor Guard, Sergeant Jim Shaughnessy, Officer Tracy Summers, Officer Jim Stevenson, Officer Falpo Luafo, Officer Marcus Lowell, and Officer Anthony Green. Thank you, officers, for being here today. We also at every Memorial Day celebration, we are fortunate to have our terrific Centerville Community Band under the direction of Gerald Foster. Centerville Community Band, thank you very much. Also, we have with us the Centerville Community Chorus under the direction of Brett Greenwood. Again, thank you for being here. And just a reminder that on July the 3rd, down at Stubbs Park, the band shell down there, the Centerville Community Band will be performing their patriotic concert along with the Centerville Community Chorus. We'd love to have you in attendance. It's a terrific show. Also, I want to thank uh, Maureen Russell Hudson, who is very involved and in, very much in putting this activity together. And Maureen, thank you very much for everything you do. And also Centerville Public Works. 
The chairs were not set up by council, they were set up by Public Works today. So we want to thank Public Works for doing so. There's a tree planted on the hill up there. There's a new marker for a family in Centerville for their son who was just recently lost in a helicop helicopter training mission. It was last month, Sergeant Derek Holly. Um, I know he and his family have been, through, have been in the thoughts and prayers of all the members of this community and they're with our thoughts today on Memorial Day. As I know this is a difficult day for them, but we appreciate their service and their son's service and recognize with that beautiful tree that they had planted here in Stubbs Park today. Well, Also, I'd like, if I could, to recognize veterans of a couple of the wars that our country has participated in. Are there World War II veterans here, other than our speaker today, Mr. Tobob? And any World War II veterans, please stand up and receive a great round of applause. Are there any Korea War veterans here today? I'm sure there are a number. For Vietnam War veterans. Thank you all for your service. In Iraq and Afghanistan conflicts and the wars, are there any veterans from those wars here? Today? And I always thought it'd be interesting how many have participated and been part of the service in service to our country in any of the branches of our government, if, or in our military. If you'd please stand and take recognition for a job well, well done. Thank, for, thank you for all you've done in service to our country. Just like if I could, just to mention the Spring Valley Academy Chorus, uh, Miss Christy Doria is the director of the chorus, and Camden Montes, Vivian Walker, Mariah Doolin, Chanel Price, and Layla Stewart participated in their presentation today, and you'll hear them again uh, later in the program. At this time, I'd also like to just recognize a couple other people that are here today. From Washington Township, uh, Joyce Young, former trustee, and Lee Snyder, trustee, are all here for Washington Township. And then Vice President Dale Berry and Sharon Lowry, trustees, are here today. Thank you for being here. From the Ohio House of Representatives, Jim Butler and Naraj Antani. And our state senator representative, Peggy Lehner, is here this morning. From Montgomery County, a Centerville resident, uh, Treasurer Carolyn Rice. I know she's here. There she is, back in the back. Okay. And from our Kettering Municipal Court, uh, Judge Jim Long. And our Clerk of Courts, Andrea White. And I'd like to mention also the Centerville City Council members who are here today. Uh, Deputy Mayor Belinda Kenley. She's back in the, right there. John Beals. And John is seated with former Mayor Sally Beals. Joanne Rao up front. Uh, John Paltcher. John's up, John's there. And Council Member Mark Engert, right up here. And Mark brought along a special guest with him this morning, uh, Major Jared Burley, who lives in the Pleasant Hill neighborhood, and unfortunately is leaving the Dayton area to go to Alabama for a new assignment. Uh, Major Jared Burley, we appreciate all you've done for our service. We're glad you are a member of our community, and we hope that you come back uh, to live in Centerville at future dates. Major Burley's family is behind him there, and they do a lot, I'm sure, in support of Major Burley. And if you don't mind, we'll have the 
The kids stand up and Mrs. Burley stand up. <laughs> They're a beautiful family. And Council Member Bill Sayre is also here this morning. There's Bill. Okay. I hadn't forgot him. I just... <laughs> and I believe that uh, former Mayor Mark Kingseed is here today also. I haven't seen Mark yet today, but I know he was on his way over here. And I believe our city manager, Wayne Davis, is also here. I know he was on his way over here. I know there's a parking issue back there. So uh, they're on their way, I know that. When I was a young boy, there was a television show that my father, my brother, and I often watched about the battles of World War II. After one of the shows, I asked my dad, who was a Navy lieutenant during World War II, who served in both the Pacific and European theaters, if any of his friends had died in World War II. I remember this exchange as clearly as if it was yesterday. He was quiet for just a brief period of time and simply said, everyone lost friends in the war. My father, like the millions of other men and women who have served our country over the years, spoke or speak little of what they saw. They never talked about their individual and collective career. My father, like millions of other men and women who have served our country, spoke little or never talked about what they saw. They never talked about their individual and collective courage, which they exhibited in battles and in their service. Nor did they ever do or brag about what they did and what they are doing to protect the liberties of our country. As I stand at this podium, I can look and see many of you, we had recognized them who served our country. You've never asked for praise, but you are proud, as are we, in what you accomplished and the service you offered. You have faced extraordinary circumstances with courage, honor, and self-sacrifice in service to your country. And like the many millions who now serve and have served before you, you are quiet and reflective in honoring that friend, a fellow service member, a brother, a sister, father or mother who died in service to our country. We are all honored by your presence today and we humbly share with you in remembering and honoring those friends who have fallen. On this, the last Monday of May at Stubbs Park, like many other cities across the country, we gather to honor and remember the over one million that have fallen in service to our country. Millions of Americans served in World War II, hundreds of thousands on both sides of the 38th parallel in Korea, the jungles and rice fields of Vietnam, the deserts and cities of Iraq, and the fields and mountains of Afghanistan. Many, many friends lost their lives. The sacrifice was great, but it has not been in vain because every American, not just some of us, but every American and every free nation on earth can trace their freedom and their liberties to those many friends who are buried under the white markers in places like Arlington National Cemetery and the American Cemetery in Normandy, near Normandy, France. As President James Garfield noted at a dedication for fallen soldiers during his very short presidency, he stated, we do not know one promise the fallen made, one pledge they gave, one word they spoke, but we do know they summed up and perfected by one supreme act and the, the highest virtues of men and citizens. For love of country, they accepted death and thus resolved all doubts and made immortal their patriotism and their virtue. So not just today, but every day of every week of every year, let us remember and honor those friends and family members of our friends whose lives were lost. Let us keep them with us when we recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Let us feel their presence during the Star Spangled Banner. And let us never forget that the 50 stripes on the blue field with 13 red and white stripes is not just a beautiful piece of fabric, but it is in fact that friend or that family member who never came home. We feel it in our hearts, and we know it instinctively, that our flag would not be the symbol of freedom flying proudly above us 
today were it not for their sacrifice of yesterday's. May God bless those fallen friends, their families, and the United States of America on this beautiful sunny day in Centerville, Ohio. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to call Pastor Mark Daniels to the podium. He is the pastor for the Living Waters Lutheran Church to lead us in our invocation. Pastor Daniels. Let's pray. Lord of the nations, we gather today to remember and to honor the military personnel of the United States who have given their lives to protect this nation from all enemies of our freedom, foreign and domestic. We thank you that by their sacrifice they have preserved and entrusted to us a constitutional democracy which has for nearly two and a half centuries been the envy and aspirational model of people all over the world. We pray that we would honor their memories with more than just our words, songs, prayers, and salutes today, honoring them every day by being committed, informed citizens, and caring neighbors. May our lives memorialize our honored dead through a steadfast commitment to being the nation that seeks liberty and justice for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Salute.
Please be seated. Thank you, Scouts. Appreciate your doing that very much. Today we are extremely fortunate to have Centerville's own here today, uh, Robert Philbobbin. He was a soldier in the 111th Infantry in the Pacific Theater. He participated in three campaigns, the Gilbert Islands in 1943, the Marshall Islands in 1944, and the Palau Islands in 1945, and he holds the Combat Medic Badge and Bronze Star Medal. Bob is a longtime Centerville resident, and many of you know him. He's a professor emeritus of political science at Wright State University, where he taught for over 40 years. He is the author, co-author, and editor of seven books and over 40 essays and articles. During the 1980-81 academic year, he was a visiting fellow at Clare Hall and Cambridge University in England. And in January of 1993, he was a visiting professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And he is a member of the Centerville VFW Post 9550 and a proud resident of Centerville. We are honored to have Mr. Thobobin to speak to us today. Professor. Albert, Albert Einstein, well, he changed the way all humanity looks at, uh, at the world and the universe. Uh, and a uh, pretty smart guy. And uh, I thought he also wrote a lot of things. He wrote on religion. He wrote on uh, uh, social problems and so on. One of the things I particularly like was this quote that you see on here. If you can't read it in the back, I'll read it for you here. Uh, Albert Einstein said, example isn't another way to teach, it's the only way to teach. Could you hear that? Example isn't another way to teach, it's the only way to teach. Okay, so what I'm going to do today, is, so you can rest easy, is uh, I'm going to do two things. I want to tell you a little bit about my outfit, the 111th Infantry Regiment, of which I was a part. And then I want to bring to your attention... Um, Four guys, their names are right up here, uh, as you can see. Uh, the first, and... Uh, I'll hold this up. Okay, all right, thank you. <laughs> About 15 years ago, I started interviewing uh, uh, World War II veterans who live in Centerville and Washington Township. All the people I'm talking about are your neighbors or were, they're probably all dead now. Uh, but uh, I, they're, there are two or three of them are. There's one guy, Ray Hill, if you're in here, please stand up, because uh, I tried to find, very hard to find him out, and I couldn't. Anyway, these are all your neighbors. This is kind of, I, this book is kind of, this is the product of those interviews. Incidentally, you can, you can hear the full interview of uh, my interview with, say, Peter Granson or, or uh, uh, what's his name, Art, 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 uh, Art What's his name? Ensley. Okay. They're down. At the, they're down at the um, historical society at the Nutter Cottage. They're all on DVD. So you, if one of them strikes your interest, which I'm going to mention, then you can you can uh, look this up. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is is my my unit, 111th Infantry Regiment. It was a part of the 28th Division in 1940. Uh, they there used to be four regiments in a uh, division. They, they streamlined them. Now there's only, in 1940, they made three. The 28th Division went to Europe. My unit went to the Pacific. We were, we were, the, we were one of them. Uh, I don't need that. And um, uh, I joined the 111th out in uh, California in a place called, if any of you have been to the Pacific area, you know that it's Camp Stoneman. If you go in there, you're not coming out. That's, uh, it, it was uh, very high walls and barbed wire and everything. You know you're going overseas. And uh, so I, I went over to Hawaii, and um, it's about a four-day trip. Uh, it's 2,200 miles from, Cal from San Francisco out to the, these little diamonds in the Pacific. Incidentally, there's nothing for 2,000 miles around any uh, around those things, so you'll recognize them if, if you've ever been there. And uh, when I was there, I could have walked in any battalion. There's three battalions in a regiment, 
And um, I could have walked in the first, second, or third. And a friend and I said, well, we'll walk in the third. We had no reason for doing it. Unfortunately, that wasn't a, well, it, it's a sort of fortunate and it's unfortunate. Um, uh, we left in one week. We're heading out for the first campaign in the, in the Central Pacific. And uh, the other two, res uh, other two battalions stayed in Hawaii for a year. And you can imagine if you're a soldier, how we complained about this. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, now looking back, I'm really glad that I did or I got through it. And uh, um, it, it, it was a thing. So first of all, with the Gilbert Islands, if you visualize Hawaii, go 2,000 miles southwest and you'll come to the equator. And um, that's, we're about one degree or two degrees off the equator. Everything is 85, the water, the air, the rain, uh, everything is 85 at all time. And, um, we, oh, what I want to do, this is very important to me, I want to distinguish between assault troops, assault infantry, and support infantry. I was in a, a support infantry outfit, you, you understand? Or you will when I'm through. Okay. <laughs> There's, there's a there's a difference there. Okay, the 27th, uh, a, a couple of regiments of the 70, of the 27th Infantry Division were the assault troops, and um, uh, when uh, as soon as the combat is over, there's, uh, the assault troops are so beat up, you have to pull them out and send them back to Hawaii or New Caledonia or someplace to get replacements. And my troop went in. As I think about the Macon campaign. Uh, what we did there, you say, well, what did you do as a support troop? Well, one thing we did was we built defenses. We tried to do that to, in case there was a, uh, a re-invasion of the islands because the Japanese were only about 150 up at Mili in the Marshall Islands, 200 miles away. And, um, oh, and then we had, uh, then uh, as I think about it, we just endured because we got bombed or strafed every day, I mean, sometimes two and three times a day. And uh, as I think about my involvement in that, uh, that's what I remember about it, is uh, the bombings, you couldn't mistake it because, uh, uh, and, and finally, finally we moved, that, was, that was over. We did, I suppose, I kept a diary. Okay, this is one thing that was really important. I kept a diary, you're not supposed to, but I kept it anyway. And I wrote all these letters home. I always like to write. And uh, I wrote 195, and my mother, I didn't know it, she saved every one. I still have them, one to 196. They're pretty much the ravings of a 19-year-old, but uh, some of them are, are pretty good. And so I can, recon I can really reconstruct uh, the first year and a half of the war, day by day. Uh, then we went, and then we went, they decided to go further than that, we, uh, we went on to the Marshall Islands. If you look on a map, that's only, you only, they're, they're only a couple hundred miles north and a little bit more west. And I went to a, a, an island called uh, Kwajalein. Oh, Kwajalein is, a, is an atoll. There's 93 islands in this atoll, and there's one way in, and there's one in the south, and one way in the north. Uh, my unit, my uh, third battalion, uh, we took uh, 11 islands. The seventh division only took one, but it was a lot harder than ours. Like, it's uh, two different things, really. The assault troops uh, are just what they are, and I'm, I'm gonna explain what they are in, in a minute. They're the ones who are going in first. We took uh, radio stations, weather stations, the islands, they guarded the South Pass, and we set up our cannons, and we would, um, uh, we would, uh, you know, I mean, you're not getting through there unless we, my uh, battalion, a battalion incidentally is about 1,300 men, okay? That's all we were. Only the third battalion went out on this thing. And uh, uh, we took, as, according to my diary, uh, a, a 11 of them. And uh, let's see what else do I have here. No, that's, that's, that's it. That's essentially what we did. Uh, we were there for... Uh, Quite a few months doing that, and um, then we went on. Then we oh, then we went to rest camp, and you have a picture of me in the back of the program. That's in rest camp in Kauai, and that was really great because they gave you a truck. And in the army, I don't know why things happen. I have no idea why I was given a truck. And they said, "Well, you're going to deliver barracks bags." Oh, 
My highest rank attained was a private first class, okay? And I am not a, oh, one time I, I have a grandson who went to West Point and graduated from there. And he invited me up there, and so they wrote me a letter. They said, would you, would you kindly come along and talk about strategy and tactics? Uh, so I wrote them back. I said, I don't know anything about strategy and tactics. <laughs> I said, I know what bombings are. I know how to take an island, but if it's not too heavily, if there are not too many Japanese on it. And, uh, and, uh, so, but I went there, and I played, I played them for these cadets who were... Well, there, well, Nathan graduated, and he went out and served for five or six years, and he found out he liked something other than the uh, Army, so now he's a civilian. But he did graduate from there. And uh, then we went, we went back to the rest camp. We were there for about four or five weeks. And then we went out, the whole regiment went out, and we went to the Palau Islands. Okay, this is where we probably had the most activity. There, oh, they're 5,000 miles west of Hawaii, okay? If you look on a map, uh, you'll see them. They're uh, south of Japan. I mean, that's getting pretty far. It's, that Pacific Ocean is immense. I mean, it took us weeks to get out there. And um, in the Palau Islands, there is a book uh, uh, by E.B. Sledge, okay? It's called, it's by, he's a Marine. Are there any Marines here? See, there's no one. Uh, well, okay. Well, they, they were the assault troops, okay? About 18,000 men. 18,000 men. And, and, and um, this is a quote from his book. I, I, I hope I do it justice. This is Sledge talking. He had never been in combat before. Never. He's, he's in his Amtrak circling like this. Then they line up, okay? Uh, he said... Everything my life had been before and has been after pales in the light of that moment when the coxswain threw the, threw the throttle forward on his Amtrak and these, these are going towards this flaming, smoke-shrouded shore of Peleliu. Because you don't know how you're going to behave. You think you want to do your duty, but you never really know till you hear those bombs or these uh, shells coming. And you, there's all kinds of people in the world. We're all individuals, and we are all going to re react differently. Anyway, he went in there, and he survived the battle. The 1st Marine Division ceased to exist as a fighting unit in six weeks. They corporals were taking the role of company commander in the Peleliu campaign. It, please read this called With the Old Breed. I didn't write, he wrote it. I communicated with him a couple times and uh, I have a signed book, but I value it so much I wouldn't even bring it out here because something might happen to it. Sledges, if you ever see anything in the Pacific, it'll, they'll be using sledge for a background. He's great. Okay, then they sent, they had to pull them out, and then they put, put in the 81st Infantry Division, okay? They were over on Angar Island, that's another island that we took up there. It wasn't near as bad a battle as uh, Peleliu. And um, they secured the island, okay? And then they pulled them out. Then the 111th Infantry went in, you got it? Now you see, there's the difference there. Uh, we, we were basically mop-up troops. That's what we did. Every day we did patrols. And when your sergeant says to you, okay, Bob, you're going on this patrol today, well, then you're going to go because uh, one, I suppose one of the big lessons, while I named this book for comrade and country, you, you've got to get along when you're in the Army. You, you have to. And um, so, it's not a day to go on sick call when he says you're going to go on the patrol, okay? Uh, because if you did, you couldn't live with these other guys. You couldn't, uh, and uh, so that was one thing that we did. That was daily, every day. I mean, I didn't go every day, uh, and, and, and you never, never, you see people with red crosses, none, or, 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 or ribbons, you wouldn't wear any sign, none of this junk, you know. You wouldn't put that on, because of course there needed to be a target. And another thing we did was to bombard the northern. We took the four southern islands. And I don't mean we. I mean the, the 1st Marine Division, 80, 
what did I say? 81st Infantry Division, yeah. But th there was an, uh, we uh, bombarded the uh, northern Japanese islands. There's 25 to 30,000 Japanese soldiers. They're very good fighters. And they were up on Koror and Babelthop. Uh, those are, if you look on a map, you'll see them. About 12 miles, these roaring, huge cannons would shoot up there. And we bombarded them. Then we went up to an island called Garakairo, or I did, and uh, with a with a machine gun. I was I was a uh, I was an aid man. Uh, you know, I was like the physician of of this platoon, uh, and I was in what we called the milk battalion. M I L N K. I L N K are rifle companies. M is heavy weapons. I was with heavy weapons, and we set up machine gun outposts because Japanese would. Uh, build rafts and they would float down. They could do nothing, but they would do it. They're, as they say, they're, they're stalwart people. And, uh, and then we had our machine guns and they would be blown out of the water. And uh, let's see, what else did we do? Oh, we did, uh, we did, uh, uh, I have to look at my notes here for a minute to see what we did. Uh, well, machine gun outposts, machine gun outposts. Uh, I have to read this part. Oh, we did island sleeps, sweeps. I didn't happen to be in on any of those at all. That, there was a, this was the whole regiment now. There were, I think the, uh, the other two regiments must have been doing that because ours didn't do that. Uh, we did the machine gun outposts. Oh, oh, and then we, they said, you, 3rd Battalion, we're 1,300 guys. You're going to go up and take the surrender to the Japanese. And we said, oh, well, couldn't you send some of the other uh, <laughs> troops? But you can't say those things, you know. So we went up there, and we're, we're going up. You're weaving through on what's called an LCI, Landing Craft Infantry. And we got up to Karor. That's still today the capital. Some of you, if you're snorkelers, I guess it's very good snorkeling up there. Or scuba diving. And um, uh, in about 10 minutes, uh, about 15 Japanese generals and their adjutants came on, and they surrendered their swords to our officers. Thank God. And because if they hadn't, there's thousands of them there. Those are the things that we did. You can see the difference. I want you to see, understand the difference between, we did, we did a lot of things, but we were not assault, okay? That happened to be uh, my thing. Now I want to go on to my second thing. Those are my three campaigns. That's what I experienced. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about these four men, all of them, I, I would call them real warriors. And, uh, uh, what's, oh, excuse me. Oh, here. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about Peter Granson. This, this is a neighbor of yours. Peter is gone, but, uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, he, he served for three years in the army as a, as a captain, and he was head of a 4.2 inch mortar platoon, okay? He's fighting, he's in Europe. He made the, the day, day one landings in uh, Salerno, that would be in September 73, and he made the day one uh, assault troops at Anzio in January of 1944. He was in, I never heard of a guy who had been, who was in straight combat. He was in, I saw the, the commendation. He was in uh, front lines for 138 straight days. I personally never heard of anybody who was in the, uh, 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 the, the line. And he was a captain, okay? So I asked him, and you, could, and you can see him, and you can hear him in the interviews if you go to the Nut Cottage with the Centerville Historical, Washington Township Historical Site. You can see the whole interview, it's one hour. I said, well, who did you send up as forward observer? Because I'd worked with mortars when I was in training. Everybody knows that. We didn't have any drones, incidentally. You know? uh, so you had, what you have is what a guy who's called the forward observer. Granson made himself the forward observer. I said, well, why'd you do that? He said, well, they love me for this. Okay, but you can see that's a fine officer. I mean, I think so. Uh, because you have to be able to pick out the tanks, the troop concentrations, the equipment concentration, or where you want to set up smoke. And uh, he did that. Uh, he did it for 138 days in the line, combat at Salerno and Anzio. He was opposed by fierce German uh, artillery fire and tank bills. 
artillery fire is terrible. Although he was an officer, he positioned himself as forward observer, and um, he had um, he had a man. Some people, I think it's very few. They they like what they're doing. There was a, a John Matovsky. He was, it was in this was in Granson's one of his uh, sergeants. He was wounded four different times. He said, John, I can get you out of here. I'll send you back to the States, apply to officer candidate school or something, because he's a real warrior. He said, no, I like killing Germans. He's staying here. He would. I mean, he wouldn't leave. He, he, and he, and uh, Granson, uh, I played this for the cadets, where uh, your son, it's my son and my daughter-in-law, sir, their son. And I said, this guy knows something about ta strategy and tactics. And so I played, it, and I think it, held their attention. Uh, the next man I want to talk about is, uh, oh, Ray Hill, the Navy. Ray Hill en enlisted in the Navy. He's, he's the one I, if anybody knows anything about him, I appreciate it if you tell me. Uh, he volunteered for the Navy, and he volunteered for a PT boat. Do you remember we had a president called President Kennedy? Yep. Kennedy was the commander of a PT boat. They're about 70, 80 feet long, 20 feet wide. Uh, there's a lot of wood on them. There's a lot of splinters on them. And his, uh, Kennedy's, uh, the uh, dis Japanese destroyer just ran through it and, and uh, cut it in half. Well, okay, Ray Hill volunteered for this, and he was the cook. He was also, that was his, but the battle station for him, general quarters, then he was manning, I think it was, I think he was manning twin 50s or twin 40s, uh, that was his. That was his position in in, in, in the fighting, and uh, they started out fighting in um, in New Guinea. And if you, New Guinea is a very long island it, down in the South Pacific, and General MacArthur was the head man there. Mine was always Admiral Limits. Okay, uh, they were working there. And then they moved them up into the Philippines because we were getting close to them. And um, Ray Hill was on this torpedo boat. And this is the, this is the uh, campaign where the Japanese introduced the kamikaze. You know what I'm saying? They only taught them how to take off because they're not going to land, okay? They're going to crash their ships into... You don't have to have a lot of skill to take off because I, I have a private pilot's license. I know that's the case. It's, for me, it was always very difficult to land. Uh, taking off is a no-brainer. I mean, just shove the throttle forward and eventually pull back on the stick a little bit and you'll go. Uh, anyway, this kamikaze got, he, he, for some reason, he focused in on uh, Raymond Hill's sh ship and uh, Raymond Hill, uh, and they would, they would keep moving to escape, but, but of course he can fly the airplane too. And he crashed into, he, cr he crashed into the PT boat, it, probably, Hill says, would you, you, if, you pull, if you go and see the thing, he had a duck to actually keep away from it. There's 16 men on it. Eight of his crew were killed immediately. He was blown up. The ship just blew up. And he came to in the water, and he says in the interview, I said, he said, I thought I was in hell. Uh, he had uh, 50 shrapnel wounds because shrapnel, you know, metal, but also splinters because uh, there's a lot of wood on the PT boat. Uh, talk about an unusual guy. When the war was over, he survived somehow. I don't know how, but he uh, he um, he and his wife went back to the Philippines and worked for ten years to help the people there. Okay, pretty good guy, in, in my opinion. Okay, now the third one I want to talk about is uh, Carl Rotterman. I asked him, Carl, why he he was born? I think he was born in. Uh, and raised out in New Lebanon here. And all of them are from our area. These are guys, just like you see here. Uh, uh, I said, why did you join the Marines? He said, well, they're, they're the best looking uniforms. <laughs> pe 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 no, that's tr people do things for insane ideas. Okay, he, uh, he was with the 3rd Marine Division. He eventually finished his training at, you know, probably Quantico or, or, I don't know, Paris Island, I guess that's where they all go. And um, he went down, he's a rifleman in Bougainville. Bougainville's down in the Southwest Pacific. That's one of MacArthur's uh, things. And he was a rifleman there. 
And then they went up. Their next campaign was up in the Marianas. There's an island that we used to have we used to have before the war called Guam. Have you ever heard of Guam? Okay. There's four islands, Saipan, Tinian, Rota, and Guam. Tinian is where all the atomic bombing planes flew out of, if, if you're in the Air Force. Uh, I, I think that's correct or close to it. And um, I said, well, what did you do on, what did you do on, uh, on uh, Guam? Well, the Marines went so fast that they had to go back and do it all over again. <laughs> they, they, they did. Okay, so they started going, and he was on scout. And this is, I'm going to quote his words. Uh, he, was, he said, I, w I was on patrol. Infantry units do a lot of patrolling, okay? They're always looking for the enemy. Okay, when you're, I said, what do you do as a scout? Because I was never a scout. I didn't know. And uh, he said, well, it was very uh, unsettling because suddenly the sergeant would say, who's usually leading the patrol, these are his exact words. Scouts forward and draw fire. Okay, now what, what that means is you don't turn to the sergeant and say, Did you, were you aware that I could be killed? But he already knows that. Uh, but they have to know where the enemy is. These are his words. Scouts for, he said, it used to make my stomach just turn over. He said, oh. And of course, eventually the Japanese will be shooting at him. And he said, oh, now we know where they are. And so uh, <laughs> then, he would, then, he could, then he could do his strategy and tactics or whatever they're doing there. Uh, third, oh, his third campaign was Iwo Jima. Uh, that's probably the worst. I don't know what's worst. Uh, we, I, know we, I know this. We had 27,000 casualties in six weeks. The Japanese only had 21,000. 20,800 Japanese were killed. They, I think we took about 200. And you can see them. What is it, Clint Eastwood, Bob? Yeah, Clint Eastwood has a couple of films on that. They're very, quite good. We had 7,000 dead in um, six weeks. That is more than... I, and I got this from a reference librarian uh, last week at, at our uh, library. We have uh, just about 7,000 killed in Iraq and Afghanistan over 15 years. Um, and uh, he was a flamethrower operator. Okay, the, that's a terrible weapon. I don't know if you've ever seen him. They, I think it's some kind of napalm, isn't it, Bob? Yeah. They shoot, it, and of course they would be immediate targets. And you have really two wars going on there, you know, above and below. And uh, he uh, he was wounded there terribly, and uh, but he, but he survived. Okay, the last guy he, he he survived, and I interviewed him, and you can hear the entire interview if you go take the time to go there. The last guy is a guy called Arth. Arthur F. Ensley, Army Air Corps. The, you, the Air Corps guys, you guys were in the Army with us. We, we be, and then they separated you in 47 or 48, something like that. And, uh, but they were in the Army Air Corps. And Arthur, Arthur it, it, you know this, uh, miss, what is it called, the miss Memphis Bell? They're, they did 25 missions, right? Well, the Army figures, well, if you can do 25, you can certainly do 30. And if you can do 30, you can do 35. And at that time, when Art was flying, it was 50. He was flying out of Corsica, bombing things up in Austria and Italy and uh, southern Germany, or however the map goes there. And uh, when he finished, they finished at 50, all of them. And he says to the crew, what do you say we re-enlist? They said, are you crazy? <laughs> of course, the entire crew went home. And he liked it. You have to understand that some people like this. He signed up for another 50. I can't understand that. Who could? Uh, and I said, well, how many, did you, how many did, you, did you do? He said, 78 and a half. Uh, I said, tell me about the 78 and a half. He said, well, they were bombing the Brenner Pass, which is Austria and Italy. And they bombed that, and they got rid of it. Oh, I have to tell you this. This is very important. He, he got in this plane. He wasn't quite, a, well, well, it wasn't as nice as his original crew. And uh, they put on their parachute, and then they put what's called a flak jacket over it, and it snaps, okay? That's the way he describes it. Well, this one, the snaps didn't work, so he took a belt, uh, and he tied it in a square knot, okay? And so there, that's what he said, oh, I, I can do this. 
So he went and um, th and he was shot down. The plane was hit. Two people were killed immediately. Three bailed out. And he put the ship into a stall. And he and the uh, 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 what do you call it? Co-pilot. They were blown out of it. And of course, he goes to pull his ter his uh, parachute, and he can't get it off because it's on a knot and his hands are burnt. And he's trying to take. He, you know, he tells this story much better than I. He's trying. He's falling through space now, uh, over some. I don't know where he is. Uh, uh, well, someplace in in that area, and uh, he's trying to get it off. He he must get it off because he can't get to the parachute. Finally, he he does get it undone. Obviously, because you know I interviewed him, and. Uh, uh, he, he flips it off, pulls the parachute, he oscillates two times, and he lands the ground on the ground. I mean, these, these guys are, they're warriors, man, and uh, I cannot talk about such experiences because I never had anything like that. And that was, uh, is that my four? Okay. Now I want to tell you about a group, or no, not a group, one person, a special woman, my wife, Janet Smith. Mm. Uh, Okay, they always talk about Rosie the River. Okay, and I understand Rosie the River, and I think that's wonderful. Women went to work in the plants, they made a lot of money, and, uh, and they helped a great deal. But there was a lot of young women, younger than them, and my wife was one of them. She was 15 to 18 during the war. So what did she do? I'm gonna tell you right now, because uh, the, you never, I've been to 50 of these things over the years, and you never hear about these volunteers at home. Janet formed a thing that always tickled me. It's called, my son's here, he's 70, and uh, uh, what's, uh, she talked about she, the Lakeside Commandos. That, I said, God, that was the name of the group. And what they did, she got all the kids to gather uh, bacon grease. Somehow, if you're a chemist, you understand, I'm not, uh, that you can use this in ammunition. And they also collected metal, which she had in her backyard. That was one thing that she did. Now we have to pull up a couple more things here. Wait a minute. Oh, here's your aunt. She sold war bonds. She set up a she set up a like a lemonade stand in front of her uncle's jewelry store on Main Street in Lorraine, Ohio, and she sold thousands of dollars worth of uh, war bonds there. Then she did uh, this, which is probably the most important thing for, for soldiers overseas. We had no, okay, I have one of these things, you know, emails. We didn't have email. We didn't have where you can see the guy. I saw my, my, two of my grandsons overseas in Iraq. I mean, what kind of a war is that where you can see him on, say, would you like to see me go into combat now, Mom, or something like that? We didn't have it. We had snail mail and V-mail. She wrote letters, hundreds of them. That was a big activity for these, for these young. Now she's 16, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Uh, she, uh, she's uh, very active. She, she went down, they had a Coast Guard station, and her father volunteered there. He's, he's a great sailor, and he understood a lot of things. And, she, and Janet was a good sailor, the best one in the family, matter of fact. Although my son thinks he's good, but he could never beat her. And uh, no, he's a good guy. And. Uh, she taught, she taught semaphore. I only know one letter. I think this is right. Is that V? Say, assume I have two flags. Well, anyway, if you don't know, I don't know either. <laughs> I, uh, I think that's correct. And, uh, and, and of course, I, the, her birthday was on June the 4th of uh, this week, uh, coming up. Of, uh, well, she was born in 1926. And, her birthday was coming up, and we had D-Day on, on June, the, June the 6th in Europe. And of course, that stopped everything. So her, her, there was no dinner, there was no prom, there was no dancing, there was nothing. Janet and three girls drove into Cleveland and stayed in the hotel for the night. And, but I wanted, to, I wanted to recognize these young people and really to honor them. They did a lot. There were other volunteers. Janet's father worked also free. I mean, he was, in, he was a commissioned uh, an officer in the uh, auxiliary of the uh, uh, Coast Guard, yeah. I'm sorry I did, couldn't 
talk about a Coast Guard, but I didn't interview any. So I want to thank you for taking your time to listen to all this raving. And But it's, it's my uh, way I remember the war for, and what it was for me of my unit and some real, some real warriors that I've told you about. Any of them you can see are right at the Centerville Historical Society. I hope you will go there and, and do that. Thank you very much. Now we'll hear from the Spring Valley Academy Chorus. Professor, that was a great lecture. Thank you very much. That was outstanding. At this time, let me introduce Laura Perry. It was the year 1848. Two little boys, brothers, are chasing out the Indians with their stick guns. 1853, and the boys are fighting over who really won the latest round of checkers. 1861, no, sorry, 1856, and the boys are in trouble for skipping the chores to go fishing. Now it's 1861, and the little boys, now young men, are on different sides of a war. One agrees with the South, and the other will defend the Union at any cost. This was a war not fought for money, or power, or freedom. They weren't fighting against tyranny or oppression. It was war they were fighting for truth, and liberty, and unity. It was a war for America's very soul. It was a cancer made up of us, fighting against us, to test if we could survive. After a long, hard struggle, the South surrendered, and under Abraham Lincoln, the Union was put back together. During the Civil War, they dealt with many problems we are still struggling with today. One of these issues was racism. During the Civil War, Africans, as well as other immigrants, were treated as less than human. The customary belief was that they were not as good as white European men. Eventually, though it took a while, these beliefs were found to be incorrect, as they ultimately realized that they were indeed created by God and created equal, 
as the Founding Fathers wrote in their Declaration of Independence. Most people during the 1860s also struggled with the idea of equal rights. In addition to the way Africans and other minorities were treated, women were thought to be less than men and had less freedoms and rights than men. Minorities and women gained more independence and freedoms during the various civil rights movements of the 20th century. But racial inequality issues weren't the only problems during the Civil War. Many times when we recall the Civil War, we focus on the slavery aspect of the war and ignore the issue of states' rights. The South was not just fighting because they wanted to keep their slaves, but because they were afraid of a central government taking all individual control away from the states. We have started to overcome this by realizing that we are so much stronger when we are together. We have found a way for states to exercise independence while still preserving the bonds of a United States. Because of the strong bond our states have forged, we have been able to overcome evils that many other countries have fallen to, such as socialism, communism, and fascist regimes. Because of the freedom we've worked so hard to protect, more people want to live in America than any other country. The same thing that draws people to America is the same thing that inspires civic duty, something that was important to people during the Civil War. Civic duty was defined as loyalty to one state above all else. People were loyal to their state first, family second. Everything, even their beliefs, took a back seat. After the Civil War came both World Wars and the Korean War. By the time the Vietnam conflict had reached its peak, Many people no longer wanted to act on their civic duty. There were protests and riots, civic disobedience, draft dodging, and even burning of draft cards. We've come a long way from the thoughts and attitudes of the Civil War, in many ways, and are just as petty and callous as they were. We are finally starting to see the fight for equality that has been attacked since 1860 and even before. The rights of all people, regardless of race or gender, across the United States has been safeguarded. But while legally everyone is equal, the feelings of hate and animosity are still very real. Some people feel that they are still better than others, or that they are not treated equally due to the differences of race, gender, and sexual preferences that seem to divide our great country. When it comes to states' rights, some people think the government should take more control over our education, food, personal protection, and many other aspects of our daily lives. Others, however, think the government should leave their individual lives alone. Some states also think that they should be above federal law. We are still struggling with feelings of civic duty. From anti-war protests, to a widening political gap, to our all-volunteer military, you can see we have a mix. Many Americans have returned to civic duty, while others still avoid it at all costs. Over the last year, there's been a lot of controversy over the Civil War. People have been tearing down monuments to Civil War heroes in an effort to pretend the Civil War never happened. They think that if we can ignore the racism, hurt, and pain, it'll just go away. We can see what has happened in the past, and we learn from it. We are now faced with a choice. We can copy their mistakes with the same results, honor the actions of these brave world changers, or we can try something new and bold. We can do something distinctly <laughs> us.
receive the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Detachment of ten shots. Preset
Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. That was outstanding. Thank you all for being here today on this beautiful day, and thank a veteran, a veteran who has helped preserve the freedoms that we have today in our country. Thank you all for being here.